How do you manage fear? If it's responding to bombing or dealing with cops shot in the head, those are moments I will never forget for the rest of my life. You have to be able to help shape those stories. You have to be able to communicate in real time. If it's bad, it will get out. And if it's worse, it will get out faster. A large portion of people under 25 were getting their news on TikTok. That is highly problematic. Peter Donald, you've had an amazing career from law enforcement to consultancy. You've been in the comms office in New York of the FBI. You've been assistant police commissioner for the New York Police Department, director of comms for them. You decided to step back from your role at the NYPD. You set up Arena and you're also a senior advisor at Emissary Partners. Can you give us a sense of what the main reputational concerns are now for the private clients and businesses that you act for? Every particular issue is different. You see some family offices that um, have a big, very high profile reputation. You see some that you can hardly find on the internet, but that are very large enterprises. Most families are largely private, but you know, there's key questions that they should and can answer. You know, how do we think about and deal with transparency today uh, in data, right? How do you think about your own story? Do you own your search results, right? If there is one bad thing that would happen over the course of your career or because you've got a large operating business and something happens, I mean, that could be completely out of your control. How do you ensure that you're not defined singularly by one event? And then I think we continue to see several families who view reputation as part of that, that halo effect that can also increase uh, deal flow, increase opportunities, and are kind of constantly cultivating that narrative. There are people who are spending a fair amount of time thinking about that even though they may not tell you they're thinking about it. And I just wonder how your previous role in law enforcement helps when you're advising in the private sector now in terms of credibility with journalists. We have one thing in this business, it's our reputation, right? So do you have your reputation for, for doing what you say you would do? Do you have a reputation of being trustworthy? Do you have a reputation for being discreet, right? And so I think that's about the totality of your experience. If you're advising a, a large corporate or a family office that's under investigation by the government, that background specifically is very helpful for all the obvious reasons. But I still think it really comes down to trust and do I think they're gonna do the right thing by me and for me. Can you talk about a really high profile challenging situation you've had where there has been a threat to the trust and where you've had to really manage that carefully? We had a corruption issue at the police department in the Bronx involving the mismarking of crime reports where they were being marked under the threshold which made it, you know, made it a misdemeanor or a felony charge. What you tend to be measured on is homicides, burglary, robbery. How are we doing against last year? How are we doing against two years ago? How are we doing against three years ago? And in this particular case, in this particular command in the Bronx, they were underreporting the crime so they could report out better numbers. We had a system where we actually proactively identified this issue, right? We were able to see the changes and the anomalies in the data. And because there was a big swing in the, in the crime reporting, we ended up starting to investigate it internally. And then it was like, all right, well, let's look at every report and let's figure out what the discrepancies are and let's follow up. And so they had done all the key investigation work. They had proactively figured this out. But the amazing thing in that situation is we could have held on to that information for a month or two months or hoped it went away, but we did something different. The police commissioner, after talking to his entire command staff, made a decision to demote people, transfer people, and give them the maximum penalty allowed by the internal rules to reprimand them for this type of behavior, which was awful and spoke to the underlying trust of the organization. We ended up proactively communicating that in a very transparent, very thorough way, where it was a day of news and it was over. That could have been a crisis that uh, brought the mayor down and the police commissioner down and many others if we had tried to cover it up. But it was about, you know, thoroughly communicating it and doing it transparently and doing it in a very above board way, so. Right, so openness and proactivity. Yeah, you know, how do you exercise the first move? How do you be really transparent? How do you tell people what you know and what you don't know and get back to them with any 
outstanding questions that yeah. you have. Do you think there's a greater tendency now to be more proactive about reputation? I can think of clients on, uh, on all of those extremes, yeah. but I think the problem today that is hard for most people to understand is there's so much data, there's so much transparency, there's so much being published on the internet. It will be increasingly difficult over time to live in complete obscurity. I wanted to ask you a little bit about engaging with the American media because media lawyers here have quite a big role to play in engaging directly with the press in the UK. And it's a very different environment in the US. Media relations and uh, the relationship with the press corps uh, is really important. Oftentimes, if you've got a high degree of trust and you've got a long-standing relationship, you can get more done. You can have more visibility on a story. You can have more of a heads up um, you can uh, at times um, change its direction and in some limited cases maybe it's so off uh, direction that it goes away almost entirely. One example, when I was in the government at the FBI, we needed information from a news organization on an ongoing major counterterrorism, global counterterrorism investigation that was um, very much in the news. We could have sent them a, a grand jury subpoena and they probably would have fought it. But because we had a great relationship uh, with that organization, long-standing relationship, we were able to work out a deal where they actually published the things that we needed. And it wasn't published on their landing page in a way that was visible to everyone, but if you knew where it was and you were looking for it, you could find it. And yet we were able to see the photos and the video that they had that was actually gonna help our investigation. And they did it in a very above board way that worked for them. So I think it's really about trust and um, you know, can we think about how we creatively deal with something? But would also be curious on your take on uh, what, what your view is from the side of the pond. It's a more balanced approach here. There's more pressure that can be applied because the onus on truth of a story is very much with the journalist, whereas the burden of proof is more, as I understand it, with the individual organization than the US. And then you have really strong protections in the US for content hosts like social media platforms. The difference in approach is is really interesting. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much Thank for you, taking Tom. the time to come and see us. And so great to be here. Hopefully Thank you'll you. come and see us again. I would Thank love you. that. Thank you.